Well, good evening. Good to see you tonight. As we begin our time of worship together tonight, take, let's stand together, take a hymnal, turn to hymn 547, and let's sing, I Stand Amazed in the Presence. Well, good evening. It's good to see you all here tonight. This is the, the last night of our Experiencing Israel Now. And uh, how many of you have had a chance to be here at all five services? Oh, good. Yeah, we've got a number of them that were here at all five. Um, so uh, I'm, I'm glad that you've had this experience. And um, this is something that really, truly, to be able to look at the, the pictures I know that what Brother Andy was going to tell you tonight is that he mentioned this about looking at Armageddon and really when he went there, it was actually a real place. <laughs> and um, in fact, Jimmy Cox sent me a text and was just mentioning the fact that um, looking at all these pictures, you know, if you've been through Sunday school and you've been through all this, a lot of the stuff that we see is just kind of the cartoonish stuff where they do the depiction. The fact is this stuff is real. And there are people who think that, well, this is just kind of a figment of somebody's imagination. It's not. Archaeology proves so much. And if you had any doubt, all you need to do is to look at the evidence that is there. And this genuinely makes the Bible come to life. And so I'm, I'm just thrilled that we've been able to do this. Um, this is our last night. And so uh, I do want to just tell you that if, uh, if you would like to give, tonight will be the only, I'll be the last night to be able to give. And um, so if you want to uh, give to Brother Andy, to his ministry, if you would, make the check out to Marie Baptist Church and put down there that it's for Experiencing Israel Now, or you can put Andy Cook. And uh, if you will, just put that in an envelope. And as you're heading out, we have two offering boxes, one on either side of our um, sound booth back there, just as you're going outside the door. If you'll put those in, 
our counselors will get that done, and we will make sure that we get a check to him. And thank you if you have already given um, to support the ministry. And uh, I, I think we, we do well as a church in our giving, and uh, I appreciate you and your, your, your generosity and your faithfulness in that. So um, I do want to mention as we, as we come tonight, y'all please remember Miss uh, Pat Myers in prayer. We had the memorial service for Mr. J.C. today here in the, in the sanctuary, and we had a good little turnout. Uh, he had a lot of his gym buddies that were here. He was 88 years old, but he had a lot of gym buddies, and all of them were younger than him. Um, but it was, a, it was a really good time that we had. Uh, but y'all do it, be in prayer for Miss Pat, and just pray for God's grace and mercy to be upon her. Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, then I'm going to hand it over to Brother Andy. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you tonight, we thank you for a great week that we've already experienced. Lord, I know that personally you have moved in my, my heart. Um, Lord, I have seen things that I did not know. I have been encouraged by things, Lord, that I have seen. And I would just pray that tonight, Lord, that you will touch Brother Andy. I pray that you will anoint him. Give him the words to speak, Lord, as he begins to share with us about Armageddon. Lord, something that we don't know how far off it is, Lord. It could be very, very soon. But I would pray, Lord, that tonight that our hearts would be receptive, that our ears would be open, and, Lord, that you will speak to us what each one of us needs to hear. And may we take it, Lord, and be able to go out with it, Lord. And may it move us and stir us and compel us, Lord, to share the gospel with those who do not know you. Thank you for this time. I thank you for every person that is here and pray, Lord, that tonight that each one of us will walk away with a very, very special blessing. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you for being back tonight. Thank you for giving us some time on Wednesday night. I have thoroughly enjoyed my week with you, except for that brief 15 minutes when I thought I was going to die on Sunday night. Um, and I want to make sure you know about our website, experienceisraelnow.com. Is a, is a source you can springboard to some other sources. In fact, if you do like pictures and you are a Bible teacher of some kind and want to use pictures, we have another website called iBibleStock.org, and there's a link right on the front page of experiencesisraelnow.com to get to iBibleStock, and you can, um, you can access a 1,000 pictures that are free, download them. You can see the video clips and maybe use those. Our photo of the day, I've checked... Earlier this week, we were within four subscribers of being at 1,500 email addresses a day that we send this out to. If I could pick up four subscribers tonight, I would just, I don't know. It's like when your odometer goes over some mark. It would just kind of feel cool. But we, we'll give you 250-plus photos a day, a, a year, that a real quick explanation of what it's about and imagine all the learning you could do with that. I did want you to know you are supporting our ministry. As a matter of fact, we have monthly donors that make sure I can do what I do. But when we come into churches, you allow me to go into other churches and other places. I speak around the country. I speak to conferences. I'll be in Oklahoma. Um, I'll leave Saturday. be there for a Sunday through Wednesday conference. Uh, I'm looking forward to that. Later on this year, I'll be in Minneapolis. Most of our churches are pretty small, and if you ever see me in front of students, um, this is uh, not very far from here. Was it Twiggs Academy? If you ever see me in front of students uh, at a rehab center or in a prison, it's because somebody like you cared enough for me to be there because there's literally no income from schools or rehab centers, and it's just fun. It's just it's the kind of thing that wakes me up in the in the middle of the night and I see it's only three o'clock in the morning I say no you got to go back to sleep you can't go to work yet I love doing what I do and I am so grateful for all the people who've helped me do that uh, I'm hoping to go back to Ambassador International University next summer in fact um, I've got a phone call tomorrow to tentatively just book out the dates we have everything except the funds we'll need uh, to to go back to Zambia where I'll teach some seminary students Bible geography um, unless we fund such a trip as we did this year those students will never get to Israel and yet they're preparing to preach in Zambia and so it's been one of those doors that God's opened up um, that I'm very grateful for and I'm grateful for the people who make it possible for me to go we also do a lot of filming in Israel and these are the two 
two young men who've given you most of the photos and video clips you've been looking at. You know William Hahn. A lot of you remember William and Heidi. Uh, they've connected with this church before. And William is my number one photographer. If you open up one of my books, there's a 95% chance William took the photo. You can look in the credits, but he's just a phenomenal photographer. And Chris Dunn's young man from uh, Warner Robins, who is our drone pilot. He is absolutely fearless. And we now have more drone video of biblical sites than any other organization anywhere. And I just find that to be astounding what God's done. Now, tonight, I want to jump right into this. There's a lot to cover, and, uh, and so I want to maximize our time, and yet I know many of you work today and will work tomorrow, go to school today, go to school tomorrow. So the, the question is, can the land tell us anything about some of the prophecies in the Bible? And the answer is absolutely. As a matter of fact, the land itself is a fulfillment of prophecy. There's so many passages in the Bible that say things about uh, your sons come from afar and your daughters are carried on the hip. Uh, the, the wealth of the seas will be brought to you. The riches of the nation will, will come. Never has that been more true than today when you look at Tel Aviv and Jaffa. This is Jaffa where, uh, where Peter was for a while in the book of Acts. They fly along like clouds. You know, would they have imagined that people are actually landing in airplanes at Ben Gurion today coming home? To Israel the Bible says that several times Israel has come back to the land but as I quoted Sunday night in that passage I'll bring your um, children from the east I'll gather you from the west I will say to the north give them up and to the south do not hold them back this is the only time in history where we're seeing people come from the north south east and west they're coming from all corners of the globe uh, back into Israel the Bible talks about the ancient cities coming back to life in multiple locations. And every time I see these old walls around Jerusalem or I see some of the theaters like we saw last night, some of the sports stadiums, and you know that they're holding cultural events there, music events, concerts there. Um, when, you, when you drive around Israel and you see uh, Kiryat Gat, which is a play off of the word Gath, or you see the, the new city of Beit Shan next to the old ruins of Beit Shan, or you see Beit Shemesh, same thing, or you go up into the Galilee region, and there's Tiberias, a vibrant Jew Jewish city, just as it was uh, in John 21. All of this, to me, is a fulfillment of prophecy. Now, I could take you to locations that have 2,000 years of history, 2,700 years of history, 3,000 years of history. I'm just going to do one tonight. I just want to make sure you see that the Bible... When it has 3,400-year-old history, there's a place behind that history. And there's, there's rock-solid evidence that things in the past happened as the Bible said they happened. This is Hazor. When Joshua was taking the land, remember he crossed the river. The river stopped and he took all the people across. They took Jericho and then they very quickly divided the land and they took the southern part of, of the promised land. But then five kings from the north did a coalition together and Joshua marches all night long under, by God's direction and he attacks the five kings before they could really get organized and he destroys those armies and the Bible says he burned Hatzor. This is a stone that has been burned and it's in Hatzor and it comes from the Joshua time period. Um, let me just show you. See the building that Israel has built over this structure? This is, these are ruins. This was the king of Hatzor's palace. It's the largest building there, and it definitely dates back to the time of Joshua. Now, you go in here, anything below that black line, it's a steel bar. All of the bricks above it are from a later time period, but the bricks below it, the stones below it, are from the Joshua time period, and can you tell that those stones have been through a very serious fire. I mean, I don't know if you've ever intentionally tried to burn stone. You can put firewood in your fireplace. Um, how, how, do you, how do you manage to make stones crack? How hot does the fire have to be? It has to be incredible. I mean, it's, 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 uh, 
it's, it's, it's just hotter than can be described. Well, first of all, Joshua did not burn most of the cities he took. M most of the cities they just took, and then they took the farms, they took the buildings, they just moved in. The Bible talks about the people inheriting cities they did not build, farms they did not establish, and you know, they took the animals, and they, it was just God's gift to them. But he burned Jericho, he burned Ai, and he burned Hatzor. He burned those three cities. And we have evidence from Jericho. There are even some ruins from Ai, but this is the clearest evidence of a fire from the Joshua time period. Now, how did it work? Well, the king of Hatzor, and this is to tell, you can see the, the have these, these, this is really quite large. In fact, the, uh, the, the area around Hatzor that they're excavating makes this the largest archaeological site in the northern part of Israel. It is huge. And Hatzor, if you can, you can get somebody to make the stones talk for you, will tell the entire Jewish story and in, in the archaeological evidence for it. Well, Hatzor is in a valley. Uh, you can, this is a real hazy day up here, uh, but the Lebanon mountains are over here and the Golan Heights are over there, and then this sits down in a valley. Now, the king of Hatzor, when he built his palace, went right over to the Lebanese mountains, and he got some of the greatest hardwoods that were available in the world to that day. You know, the cedars of Lebanon, you've read about that in the Bible? Well, he would put a row of stones and then a row of this, this hardwood from Lebanon, and he built his palace like that. And, of course, the cross beams for his palace were made out of, out of that. But he's got stone and, and hardwood mixed in together in, in his palace. The palace was the most secure building in this community, and people were coming, you'll see in a moment, from Asia headed to different parts of the world, usually Egypt, and they were coming through and they had goods to sell. And Hatzor had goods to sell from the olive trees. And the olive oil was a very hot commodity, and it was portable, and it was very valuable. And they stored all of the olive oil in that building. So you got hardwood, stone, and a flammable fluid in the same building. And this is in an absolute wind tunnel every afternoon because the Golan Heights and the Lebanese Mountains, wind gusts here on a regular basis, just a normal day, are going to be 35 miles an hour in the afternoon. Um, and so what you've got is a perfect environment and an enclosed structure for the hottest fire possible. To, when Joshua put this city on fire, all of that olive oil going up in a slow burn and then the hardwood and the, the stones are trapped in there. It's an oven. And the wind whipping through there, just absolutely destructive. What, what I'm, and, and, and if I were to take another 15 minutes, we could go see the place where David defeated Goliath. I could take you back to Capernaum where Jesus based his ministry or over to Nazareth or Bethlehem. We could, um, we could go to um, Beit Sha'an where Saul was, was killed on the slopes or actually he took his own life on the slopes of Gilboa and his body was fastened to the walls of Beit Sha'an. And you could see how close that is and how it all adds up. I could show you time after time after time again, but the only thing I'll just say to you is that there's no other book in the world like the Bible. It's an ancient book, and it, it, it says it's giving us historical, a historical record of events. And God was at work in that history. No other religion has a book like the Bible. The Koran has less than, less than 10 geographical locations listed in it. The Koran doesn't try to tell history. It's a list of do's and don'ts. Hinduism is the same way. Buddhism is the same way. The Book of Mormon, did you know the National Geographic Magazine, the National Geographic Society, and the Smithsonian Institute have had to issue public statements to explain why they don't display artifacts from the Book of Mormon that should be in North America. And the statement is, there aren't any artifacts. That your, your holy book proposes to tell history, but there are no locations where we can dig down in the ground and find evidence of this battle or this city that was supposed to be there. 
Listen, that may sound like, and somebody may even say, that's kind of offensive. Look, my, my two-year-old grandson may feel offended if I tell him not to stick a fork in the, in the electrical outlet, but wouldn't truth be better than trying to just make him feel good about his actions? Truth's important. If you're going to base your life on, on a religious book, let's base it on a book that's true. If you're going to base your eternity on, on a message from God, make sure you've heard from the one true God. Truth is not for sale, and it's not an option to do anything except tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so help us, God, if we don't. Well, didn't really mean to go there, but maybe it was important for somebody. You never know. Let's talk about the future. That's what I promised to talk to you about tonight. And the answer is, of course it is. I want you to see that Israel is a per in perfect position to influence the world. There's Africa, Europe, and Asia. Now, that's an ocean. you got salt water there and a very dangerous thing if you put all your goods in, in a, the hold of a ship. There are lots of shipwrecks out there from the ancient world. This is a desert and there's no water. And so unless you've got a camel and very small goods like gold or incense to carry, all of, your, all of your UPS trucks and FedEx trucks and the mail carriers, everybody selling stuff is going to go from Egypt through that fertile crescent right there, and they're going to go in one of two directions up here. This becomes the highway to the world. How about this? God is going to put his people in a perfect position so that whatever God does in this land, the stories are going to spread to three continents. It's the center of the world and the ancient world. Um, well, that's, that's a small place. Um, you've got about 60 miles from the Mediterranean Sea to the Dead Sea. But when you come to Gezer, uh, you're going to overlook what's called the coastal plain or the main place where all the highways are today and where the highways have always been. Road builders would like to build their roads and their airports on flat land. And if you're flying a plane into Israel, you would like to land on a nice wide expanse of flat land and not in the mountains. So when you're looking from Gezer over to the Mediterranean, you've only got 14 miles altogether. And look, there's one of the airports right there. This is called the coastal plain. And so that fertile crescent has now narrowed down to a strip of land that's only 14 miles long. However, it gets much more narrow because of the way the land works. If you come up to the north, uh, up closer to the Sea of Galilee, you're going to see a, a range of mountains, starting with the Gilboa Mountains and going over to the Carmel Mountains. Elijah did his thing on top of Carmel, Mount Carmel. But look at these mountains. They form a very effective barrier for someone that's, that's coming in here with a string of mules or an army, uh, people walking, because look at the road. The roads don't try to go over the mountains. The roads look for a gap going through the mountains. And there's one gap that is better than all other gaps. It's only 150 feet wide, and it's called the Megiddo Pass. And that's where a modern-day highway is today. It's Highway 6. It's a toll road, and they have cameras there to monitor for speeding the next time you're going through. Be careful. And a traffic jam. There's always traffic jams in Israel. But this, this highway right here, 150 feet wide, think about it. Three continents traveling back and forth to one another. And if you've got an army big enough, to do something about it, you can put a stop sign at the Megiddo Pass, and now you can either charge people a tax or a toll for going through that pass, or if you're like Solomon, you can establish treaties with other countries that are in your favor, and if they expect to do intercontinental commerce like they've always done, you're going to have to make sure Solomon gets a piece of the pie. And when Solomon was king, Israel was king of the world because it controlled the fertile crescent in its entirety. So Solomon's son proved to be one of the most foolish people who ever lived. He lost it all in a matter of months. And the kingdom split, and, and 
well, it, it, didn't, it didn't work out all that well. But every king, every world power, the Egyptians wanted the Megiddo Pass. The Assyrians, Babylonians, and Persians wanted the Megiddo Pass, and they all took it. And Alexander the Great came in and took it. And the Romans came in and took it. And later on, Napoleon took it. Um, in World War I, General Allenby took it, and, and the Turks left and went to Turkey. And World War I changed at a battle at Megiddo. As a matter of fact, history will show that more battles have been fought over that Megiddo Pass than any other single place in the world in all of history. There's Nazareth. Here's the path coming from Asia going to Europe, I mean going to Egypt, and this one's coming from, from Turkey, and it could go over to Saudi Arabia or wherever you wanted to go. But there's a crossroads right down here, right below Nazareth. Who grew up in Nazareth? You're in church. That's usually the right answer. But there's, there's the Nazareth overlook uh, where maybe some of the people from Nazareth, let's see if you're paying attention tonight, tried to launch Jesus into his ministry. I won't tell that joke in Oklahoma. It won't work here. Like, if it doesn't work on the home field, it ain't going to work on the away arena, you know. But there's the road going from Nazareth all the way over to the Megiddo Pass. If you were to follow that road, you'd be right over there. It's 10 miles over to Megiddo. Jesus grew up overlooking the Jezreel Valley, and he, he heard all of the stories about Elijah and Elisha in this valley, and he knew all about Megiddo. But do you know about Megiddo? It's the most famous city most Bible readers have never heard of. It is in the Bible. Josiah died at Megiddo. This is Tel Megiddo. This is where the archaeological work is done. There are so many layers to this city. We're up to 32 layers now. If, if uh, something flashes up that says 26 layers, it's because they keep finding more stuff. 32 layers of civilization. That means somebody built a city on this hill. Somebody else came in and knocked it down and built on top of theirs. Uh, somebody built on top of the next one. Then there was an earthquake and somebody built again. And, but usually it's armies. It's little wonder that when John hears in this revelation he has from Jesus about all the end times events, there's little wonder that he hears that all the armies are going to gather at Megiddo. He had read the history. He knew the stories. That's where all the battles take place. So here's, here's the, this valley below Megiddo has a name. Everybody say Har, H-A-R, Har. That means mount. Now say Megiddo. Now put them together, Har Megiddo. This is Mount Megiddo in their language, and the valley immediately below Megiddo, Megiddo, we say, is Har Megiddo. It really is a place. I remember the first time we were there, uh, it was late, uh, the first time I was ever there, I was with a, a bunch of pastors, and we were in a bus. There's the valley right down there. And, and the, it was dark, and the tour guide couldn't help it. He said, well, we're in the valley of Armageddon, and every pastor on the bus woke up absolutely stunned. Nobody had told us that it's a real place. This altar right here, Megiddo is one of the most pagan places in history. There's no telling how many people, usually children, died on this altar. This was not a godly place. And it's not going to be a godly place. It's a, it's a place where godless people are going to meet their end. Um, I'm not, we will look back when we see it all play out. We will look back and figure it out as clearly as we can look back now and see Jesus and all that Old Testament prophecy. But this is Megiddo. Well, by the way, they just found something that's pretty, pretty interesting. This is, this is looking south. And so that's not the valley, that's, uh, uh, but they just found the Roman 6th Legion, um, the camp, and they, they found it up on another hill right over here to this side, but the, the, the legion was camped out in that field. I mean, they've dug down. The Romans were very meticulous. They built, every camp they built had exactly the same thing. So once archaeologists found the stones in the right place underneath this farmer's field, 
um, they knew that this is where the sixth legion camped out. Why is that important? Because those they were there were like five thousand Roman soldiers stationed here, and they scattered all over Israel. Uh, they were they were a force of terror for the people of Nazareth. Um, there's no doubt Jesus saw crucifixions in the valley of Jezreel as a child. He knew what he was getting into, and when he spoke of, spoke of of crucifixion, he, he was not talking theoretically. He had seen it. But that's Megiddo, and that's the valley of, of Armageddon below it, and the Bible says that's going to be part of end times events. Now, if you were okay a minute ago, with me showing you stones that were burned in hot sore and you connected those with Joshua and you said, you know what, that logically makes sense and I can see why they built that, that covering over it to protect it. That's important Jewish Joshua history. It predates everybody else from living here. That's why they spent all that money on that shelter. If you're okay with the Bible being true about past events, you might want to give serious thought to saying the Bible is true has spoken the truth about what's yet to come. I would if I were you. As for me and my house, I, I'm, I'm, I'm all in. I'm all in. Now, you can't do prophecy, especially from Jesus, about end times events without going to Jerusalem. So I'm going to do my best to give you a quick look at Jerusalem and try to connect it to some of the things he said during the last week of his life. Here's the Mount of Olives. There's the Temple Mount below us. Um, and Jesus, during the last week of his life, his disciples said, Teacher, look at all the buildings, and in particular, look at the temple. And, and, and truly, there were, there were no buildings in the ancient world, any, anything like it. Now, that, that Dome of the Rock is a Muslim building. This is the mosque. This is not a mosque. But nevertheless, it's the most famous building in Jerusalem. The temple was two and a half to three times larger than that and much more beautiful and Jesus sits down on the Mount of Olives and says not one stone will be left standing on another and 70 years later the Romans when they burned and destroyed Jerusalem they made sure they destroyed the temple by literally taking every stone away from the temple mount there's nothing left of the temple nothing to be found they took every stone away and they tried to destroy the wall, the retaining wall around the Temple Mount itself. Uh, it was just too much trouble, and so they just damaged it. And if you go there today, you'll see where later in later centuries, other people rebuilt the wall. A uh, little bit of identification on some things. There's the Eastern Gate right over there. There is actually an Eastern Gate under that Eastern Gate. And that's the way it always works. If you don't, if you don't um, know why it works that way, um, you know, people build something and then an earthquake comes along or a war comes along and it's destroyed. Well, all of these rocks are too heavy to lift. They don't have the machinery. And so what they do is typically spread dirt over it and then build up on the next level. And so an archaeologist digging down is going to have to go down to find yesterday. These Arab graves right in front of the Eastern Gate, the Arabs have read Ezekiel 37, 38, and it's, there's a reminder there that no holy Jewish man can go into the Temple Mount if he touches any dead bones. And so they've put all their dead bones right there on the Eastern Wall. That's an Arab graveyard trying to keep the Messiah out. They also have taken the Eastern Gate years ago, centuries ago, and sealed it up. So here's the backside of the Eastern Gate. And I used to think it was full of rock but it's, uh, it's just sealed up. The gate is sealed up with stone. I've often thought, you know, if they had read John chapter 20, there it is, sealed up with stone, um, and they, they, they might have gathered that stone is an ineffective way of keeping the Messiah in or out. Jesus isn't bothered by stones at an entrance to anything. But there's the eastern gate. Now, we do have a, a quick... An interesting little incident happened not too long ago. We, we've been able to see inside it because uh, there's, there's a little bit of turmoil on the Temple Mount and some young men rushed into this area and they claimed it was a mosque. Uh, it wasn't, but you can't, you can't open a door in Jerusalem without it being controversial. But that's what it looks like 
inside the eastern gate. And there are still people in there on their prayer rugs not not willing to let any Jewish people claim that the eastern gate might be theirs. And so that's okay. It's not a very interesting room. Um, I want to show you some, some other stuff, um, which is... All right, here we're coming in from the Jaffa Gate and moving toward the east, and there's the Mount of Olives right there. There's the Mount of Olives. And if you'll notice, it looks kind of unusual. That's not green. There are no olive trees there. Those are all graves. That's one of the biggest graveyards you'll ever see. I mean, just tens of thousands of graves, and it wraps all the way around on the other side. That was March, and I just wanted to see what was on the other side, and it's just cemetery. It's just, and it's all Jewish graves. Because Jewish people have read Ezekiel, they've read Zechariah, and they know about the Messiah, the promise that the Messiah is going to come. He's going to put his foot on the Mount of Olives, and there will be the the mountain will split, and and then there'll be a new new temple, or the the gate will open, and Messiah can come in. So that's that's your your cemetery over there, and uh, it's it's. Um, People are always fascinated by it. But why do Jewish people want to be buried there? They want a front row seat to watch the eastern gate open up and to see the Messiah come in. Now, we believe Messiah will be making his second visit when all of that happens. But I'd like to show you again um, more of what the land shows us. And by the way, you saw all the rocks on the graves. Do you know the tradition? If you know the tradition and you have a Jewish friend, you just store this away because it's a great sign of respect. When you go to someone's grave, um, and you can take a rock and you, you put it on the grave and that's kind of like putting flowers on the grave. It's a sign of respect. And, and you'll see these, these, uh, these, these tombstones out here. Uh, they've got lots of rocks on them. People have come to remember a certain individual. I asked my Jewish friend Boaz about it. I said, Boaz, rocks, I mean, it's kind of like flowers. And he said, yeah, it's exactly the, the same thing. And I said, well, got to admit, Rocks are cheaper than flowers. <laughs> he never missed a beat, and he said, yeah, and they last longer. <laughs> so, all right, now, about that earthquake. The Bible says the Mount of Olives is going to split north to south. Now, we're, we've been looking east to west, and there's a gold dome of the rock that needs to disappear if there's ever going to be a new temple. So let me show you something. If you back up, we, we're going to come back. Uh, to a west western area and go down below ground on the western wall and that's all been excavated in recent years but you can walk down here now with your group and so I'm walking along that's an old video right there but I'm walking along a stone that is enormous we can't even take a picture of it it's kind of narrow in there but this stone is 45 feet long 12 feet high 14 feet thick and estimated 570 tons you know how big 570 tons is? It's two jumbo jets loaded down with people going to Israel with all of their luggage. Two of those jets. That's a lot of weight. That's one stone. There's a lot of question about how did they get it here, and they think they, they figured it out. If it weren't for this stone, you would be noticing the other stones that are also enormous. The largest stones ever quarried in Israel are all along this western wall, and this is pretty close to the center point of the Temple Mount. The bigger question is, why are they here? Why did Herod the Great build his Temple Mount retaining wall and put these huge stones right here? And the answer is, there's an earthquake fault line that goes right underneath the Dome of the Rock, which used to be the Temple. And Herod wanted to build a Temple Mount retaining wall where no earthquake would knock down what he built. And so far, it has worked. It has stabilized. There have been several very big earthquakes in Jerusalem um, through the years. Uh, lots of damage. But the Temple Mount has stayed standing because of these stones stabilizing everything. But you know, the right size earthquake could open up that eastern gate, knock down the Dome of the Rock, and make it quite possible, easy even, for a new city, a new temple to be built suddenly in position everything that that we've read about now jesus sits down on the mount of olives and there's the passage from zechariah about about the the mount splitting jesus sits down on the mount of olives and talks to his young disciples 
about a lot of end times events, about, you know, no one knows the hour, only the Father. Uh, There's so many things that he said. Now, you can, if you use your camera right, if William is pointing in the right direction, you can make this Mount of Olives look a little bit green. And so that's what we've done here. And I just want you to picture Jesus sitting here talking to his disciples. Now, your eye is, when you're on the Mount of Olives, your eye is always, 10 out of 10 times, will be drawn to the city of Jerusalem. It's just spectacular. But if you were to turn around, you would be looking, if you were to turn around and climb up to the top of the Mount of Olives, you'd be looking down the hill at the Dead Sea. So, but, but this is what they would have seen, and you, you couldn't help but look at it. And so as Jesus is talking about end times events, um, they're all looking at Jerusalem. But right behind them is the Judean wilderness, literally right behind them. And, and it goes about 15 miles straight down to the Dead Sea. It just, the, the earth falls off right there. And that's going to be important. I was asking, can the land teach us anything about what's yet to come? Here's one of the things Jesus said. In the days before the flood, people were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage up to the day Noah entered the ark. They knew nothing about what would happen until the flood came and took them all away. And that's how it will be at the coming of the Son of Man. Now, when I hear the word flood, I am thinking the Mississippi River and its wide, slow push after heavy rains in the spring. I am thinking a hurricane in New Orleans. I am thinking about Noah, even, with the world is covered with water. But in Israel, one of the things, if you need to think like they thought, the most obvious flood was a flash flood, and the flash floods happened right behind them. They started in Jerusalem. You see the deep valley, the Kidron Valley right there? So there's the Kidron Valley. It starts spinning around, and there's the Judean wilderness, and there's the Dead Sea. There's the Dead Sea down there, and there's actual photograph, and you can see the familiar hills of the Judean wilderness. Jerusalem's 2,500 feet above sea level. The Dead Sea's 1,400 feet below sea level, and you've only got 15 miles between the two points. And when it rains in Jerusalem and Bethlehem, and the rain starts running off through all of these canyons, the little rivers start, and the little streams become little rivers, and then the little rivers join, and they become big rivers, and what you get is flash floods. This is not the first time Jesus has mentioned floods. I, I, I share with you at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, he told a very important parable. But anytime you see these deep ravines, these canyons, this is where the water will run. And you can see these small rocks uh, left over after the, can, after the flash floods. Um, I would never take a group into this area during, during a time when rain is, is possible. So I'm not there in January, February, or March. No way, not in November. You know, in the summertime like this, you can go there all day long. It's not going to rain. If it did rain, it would be a miracle and it would be a little two-minute shower. But a flash flood in this area could be very, very dangerous. Now, when this flash flood comes over the top of this last hill, it's roaring and the, and the rocks are different colored. But when it gets down here, it leaves behind a, a, a bed of sand. Now, maybe you don't think that's unusual. Around here, maybe a bed of sand is not unusual. But in Israel, the only place where you're ever going to see sand is at the end of, of that flash flood. You'll see a little bit on the Mediterranean, very little bit. Uh, sometimes the beach is no wider from me to the first pew. The Mediterranean, on that part of the Mediterranean, it just bangs the coast. It, it doesn't leave a nice beach. But for people from the Galilee where Jesus did most of his teaching, and people in Jerusalem where he did most of his teaching, the only place they ever saw sand was at the mouth of a wadi. Now Jesus told a parable. I'm going to show you some flash flood footage. Jesus said at the end of the Sermon on the Mount, here's the deal. Anyone who hears my words and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rains fell down, and the waters rose, 
and the winds blew and beat against his house, but it stood because its foundation was on the rock. But anyone who hears these words of mine and fails to put them into practice, and by the way, that would include just about everybody who's gone to church. There are times when we hear the words and fail to put them into practice. But let's say for that person who hears them over and over and over again and fails to put them into practice, never one time accepts the gift of salvation, never puts in these practical instructions, is like a man who built his house on the sand. Well, the rains came down and the waters rose and the winds blew and beat against the house. And when you read Luke's incredible language of his parable, he said, and then the house exploded. Nine months out of the year, you go to the mouth of a wadi and have a picnic down there. And and there's no danger whatsoever. But what would happen if you built your house down at the base of this hill on that nice flat bed of sand and you thought nothing would ever happen to you. Would that be wise or foolish? I don't think your house is going to survive that. As a pastor, I watch so many people self-destruct. It's one of the most frustrating parts about the job. I mean, there I was in a perfectly good-looking church, and I was a fairly good-looking preacher. And we were preaching the Word. And one Wednesday, uh, we were praying for our people. I, I have always enjoyed prison ministry, but we were praying for our people. And I kept listening to people, my people, who were in behind bars. There were like six that morning, including a, a mom who'd been caught shoplifting. She had a perfectly nice family. There were some students who had gotten involved in drugs. You know, it may sound like the smartest thing possible. All these other students are going off to college or going into the military or getting a job and clocking in and clocking out and working. You know, there are shorter ways. There are shortcuts to making a lot of money in this culture right out here in Lawrence County. But that's also the fastest ticket to jail. You can build your house here if you want to, but let's say you started building. Wouldn't people come along and warn you about the flash floods? Wouldn't the people who live there say, hey, stop, stop. You don't want to don't you don't want to build that. You won't believe what happens here every year, a couple of times a year in the winter, because the rains are going to come. You're not even going to know it's raining in Jerusalem. That's fifteen miles away. You will not hear the thunder, you will not see the cloud. But all of a sudden the, this this water's going to come. And it's just going to pour over here. And anything you build down here is going to be lost. And somebody else comes and warns the person building a house. And if you just keep ignoring the message, ignoring the message, ignoring the message, well, you're going to get what you asked for. I want to show you one more wadi, and we're, going to, we're at the finish line now. This is Wadi Zafit. This is a YouTube video. I have, I have hiked in part of this canyon i just want to show you see the rocks down here it looks like somebody piled them up it's the water that piled them up and most of these rocks were bigger when they hit the wall but they split when a wadi flood comes in a narrow place like this it's coming very very fast it's very violent and it's carrying a lot of litter a lot of trash a lot of rocks what I'm trying to say is there have been people out here thinking, well, I could probably swim out of it. You know, I could climb up real quick. No, you really can't. If you get down in this wadi right here and the flash flood comes, drops over there, see how white that rock is? That's how deep the water is. And the first thing that's going to happen is going to knock you off your feet and you're going to hit your head and then you're going to pass out and then they're going to find your body two to ten miles away from here. You don't want to go down into such a dangerous place if it's a dangerous day. How are you going to get out? In April of 2018, 
late April. I always schedule my trips when I take groups when I feel like there's no way it's going to rain. I want the best weather. I want, you know, kind of cool, warm weather. And I don't want it to rain. And so we, we booked a trip for late April in 2018. And we got there, and the guide I had, we were, we were walking around the Valley of Elah where David beat Goliath, and we were just having a good time stretching our legs after that long flight. And so it was day one. And he says, listen, I hate to tell you this, but they're expecting rain tomorrow. I said, what? It's late April. He said, I know. I said, well, I'm, what do you mean rain? He said, well, heavy rain. I said, no, that's impossible. He said, it's coming out of Saudi Arabia. No, that's really impossible. He said, well... Let's look at the weather app. And we looked at the weather app on our phones, and it said at 7 o'clock tonight, the wind is going to change direction, and it's going to rain torrential rains for the next three days. I don't know if you've ever taken a group of people to Israel and been responsible for them. Uh, you're getting ready for that. But I don't have any indoor activities for a group. The whole trip is outside. Three days of torrential rains, and we were down at the Dead Sea by nightfall. So we're down where those well, wadi floods come out. You know, I don't even know if the bus is going to be able to travel along the road on the Dead Sea. And we all just said, okay, we're going to, you know, we, and we, I got my group together, and we all talked about it. They looked at the weather, and it's like, you know what? It is what it is. God's in control. We're going to have a good attitude about it no matter what. And I was very appreciative of that, but I was still a little stressed out. But I told my group that that night. I said, here's my real concern. Somebody is in the wilderness, and he, he wanted to just get away from it all. Been working too hard, and he wanted to go camping. Happens all the time. Maybe he rode his bike out there. And he's got his little pup tent. And he intentionally didn't take his phone or he doesn't have any kind of cell service. Because it's really hard to find cell service in the wilderness. And I said, I, what I'm afraid of. Every, it's so ingrained in everyone's mind that it doesn't rain in late April. And it, it's not, if it did, it wouldn't be a dangerous rain. It's so ingrained. Even if the sky turns black, I'm afraid somebody's going to die tomorrow. And I remember telling them that. And I really was worried about it. And the next night, by the time we went to bed, and we had been watching the news all day, I realized I would underestimated it. It wasn't one. It was ten. And they were all high school seniors. They had all gotten in Wadi Zafit. It was part of a bonding exercise before they went into military. One of the girls texted a friend of hers and says, we're going to die tomorrow. They got this thing planned for us. And her friend said, they'll never put you anywhere dangerous. And one of the guys was reaching down trying to get one of the girls out, and the flood took her from him. And I was so heartbroken. I mean, I felt like I resonated with the rest of the nation. We all felt like they were our children, our friends. Our, those families were our family. Why in the world would I show you these images right here at the end? Because if we're not careful, we live in the Bible Belt. If you're here on a Wednesday night, you've probably come to church a lot like me and read your Bible a lot. It's real easy to be entertained by more information about stuff we already knew a lot of stuff about. And I just want to remind you that Jesus said the end is coming. And there's not like going to be a take two on this. You get one lifetime and there is a scheduled moment when you will take your last breath. And you need to be ready for that. And you've got this window. Part of this window is like right now to make the right decision about your eternity. And let's Let's just assume for a minute everybody in the room has made the right decision. You've trusted Jesus. And you, you, you know that when you breathe your last here, your next breath is going to be full of heaven's air and it will be the hand of Jesus who lifts you up and, and, and what joy there will be. But I want to ask you something. Those faces that just flew by, do you have any faces in your life, people that you know, 
that you're worried about? Has it been a, been a while since you wept over the eternal destiny of a family member that you know is lost? What about somebody you work with or go to school with? Would it be all that much trouble tomorrow to have a conversation, to just go fishing like Jesus asked you to do? To see if maybe we could have a conversation that would change someone's life and eternity? If God's already put a name in your head or a face in your brain, can I just tell you I didn't put it there? And that there may be something happening in that person's life right now that's setting up a perfect opportunity if only someone would come along tomorrow and say, hey, could we just, could, could we just stop for a few minutes? I want to talk to you about something serious. I, I want to talk to you about what's changed my life. I want to invite you to come to our church. I don't care how you do it. Just go fishing. God to take over. God to take over. Go to Israel today. And you're going to see that almost everything you see is made of rock. It's so easy to hear what Jesus had to say and just do it. You'll, make, you'll live your life with fewer regrets and you'll make wiser choices. But if you really, 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 really want to, you can build you a house right there. It won't last long. I mean, sooner or later, that, that canyon's going to explode with water. And whatever is built down here is going to disappear. God, thank you for drawing us together. Thank you for reminding us of some very serious things tonight. And as far as the end goes, you're in charge. We trust you. You told us the end was coming. You gave us details, some of which have already passed, some of which seem to be right on top of us. Modern-day state of Israel seems to be prophecy coming back to life. It was being fulfilled right in front of our eyes. Maybe there's not much time left before the big ending. But in a room filled with this many people, we all know from a practical sense, there's not a lot of time left for somebody. God, I thank you for reminding us that it's important to be in a right relationship with you more than anything else, more than, more than our financial health, more than our physical health or our emotional health. God, we need to be right with you. And so... Do whatever it takes to get us into that right place with you. We want to build that life of ours on the rock. And, and God, as for me and my house, we want every member of my family to be there. We want all of our friends to be there. And even, we even want people we don't know well. I just want to share the message with as many people as possible. Thank you for a church that has that same heartbeat. And God, show us the way. May it happen even before we go to bed tonight, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Um, I'm just going to say this, that if you... If your house is built on a rock, obviously Jesus says you're doing fine because he's the rock. Um, some of you may realize tonight you built on sand. Um, maybe it's time to move. <laughs> maybe it's time to relocate. Uh, this is the invitation. You might be dealing with some things and you recognize I've, I've, I'm, really at a, I'm in a bad place right now and it's on the sand. God in his grace will oftentimes give us time to make a decision. But at some point, destruction will come if you don't obey him. This could apply in so many areas of our lives. Some of you might find right now you're examining and you're realizing there is, you're, you're far away from God. You've been closer at times, but you realize right now you have wandered, you have drifted. Be careful. Maybe we've got some tonight, and you can honestly say that um, I've, I've, I've never, I've never.
I've never been on the rock. I've never trusted Christ. Come tonight. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. He won't turn you away. We're going to sing just as I am. And as we sing, if the Lord is dealing with your heart, I want you to come. Let's stand together, please. Just as I am without one tree, my path I fly, my shepherd be, my path thou keepest me, unto thee, O Lamb of God, I fly, I fly, just as I am, can be seated for just a second. Brother Andy, again, you have taught me something I did not know. You have revealed something in Scripture that I was not aware of, and I will now look at that in a very new light about building on the sand. I just, I didn't realize that sand was in such a precarious location. I did not. It, it just really never knew that, and I really, really appreciate that. And I will tell you, I don't know if you're like this, but whenever he has done his teaching and these things get revealed and I, I do want to give a plug here. That's what his writings are about. He reveals this stuff that you typically are not really accustomed to from a cultural standpoint, the geographical standpoint. Uh, having been there 25 times really gives Brother Andy a unique perspective on this that he can bring out some of these things that you just don't typically get as you're just, as you're just reading your Bible. But I'll hear these things that you do, and it's like I got to go read that, and, and I get to see it in a new light. And the thing that struck me is, golly, just think, whenever we get to heaven, all this stuff, how, man, is God just going to let Scripture come alive to us and say, this is what you didn't see? And it's like there for a moment I was thinking, I'm not ready to check out right now, but it's like, man, what about when we get to heaven and all this stuff is revealed to us? How glorious that's going to be. It is going to be wonderful. Listen, thank you all for coming. I, I hope and pray that you won't just take what you've heard and just say, well, that was interesting. Apply these things to your life. Some real biblical application here. We've, we've heard the words that Christ taught us, and he taught these things for a reason. And so I want you to go out, and I want you to try to live more faithfully. Remember these things. And, um, and of course, I hope you will sign up. I, I was one of them that signed up while you were talking. So I'm one more. You're closer to that 1,500 right now. Um, Brother Andy is going to be out of the back. If you, if you have not purchased any of his books and you would like to do so, he'll be back there. Some great resources and some of the same things that he has taught in here, just revealing these things, you can get that in his writings. And again, one last um, plea to you. If you would, if you'd like to give to his ministry, you can put it in our offering boxes there at the back. And uh, be generous because, again, there are places that he goes that there is no income. And I've told you as a church before that I believe that we are in a position where we can give extra, maybe where there's churches or ministries that maybe can't give as much. And it certainly helps that if you're in the ministry and you're depending upon the Lord, there are some places that you go, they just don't have it. And you have always been a faithful church, and I appreciate your faithfulness in that. And so as you're leaving tonight, if you would, you just go ahead and give, and we'll make sure that Brother Andy gets that. Brother Andy, thank you much. We will... I've, we're going to have you back again, so 
I, I enjoy you. I really do. I, and I'm, I'm saying this in all honesty, and I know this is a preacher. I know there are times that I'm preaching at times, and you're thinking, is he done yet? Uh, and, 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 you know, here's the thing. What did you say, Lot? What, I thought that was, is that come from Lauren? Okay, well, never mind. We'll talk about it later. So, okay, everybody's just pointing fingers back there. Oh, it was Francis Graham. Well, that doesn't surprise me at all. <laughs> I can honestly say, every time you finish, I was disappointed. I wanted you to keep going. I literally, I could listen to this all night. I love this. I love looking at the pictures. I love the teaching. And it's like, whenever you would finish, I'm like, really? Are we done? So... We're going to have you back. I appreciate you. And I love you as a brother. And um, I'm, I'm glad that we're able to be a part of your ministry and to help you. Thank you all again. Let's have a word of prayer and we're going to close out. Lord, as we come before you, we just want to thank you for this week that we've had. Lord, for the teaching that we've had. And I, and I pray, Lord, that we will not just let this fall on rocky ground. But, Lord, that the teachings will fall into some good soil. And, Lord, that it will bring forth some good fruit in our lives. I thank you, Lord, for the depth of your word. And, Lord, people who read it and think that it's boring, Lord, they just don't understand it. How marvelous is your word. And we thank you that you love us enough that you gave us your word. Father, thank you that you love us enough to give us your son. As we go out now, we pray for your blessings. We pray for your grace and your mercy. Help us to be a faithful witness to you throughout all the world. To you be the glory. To you be the praise. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you all. You are dismissed.